morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining another episode of the Pretty Agile Meetup. Uh, we're really excited today to invite Melissa Reeve as a part of the Agile Marketing Alliance uh, here to come and talk about all things Agile marketing. Melissa, of course, used to work for Scaled Agile at one point in time and had a wonderful podcast, uh, even interviewed some of the Pretty Agile team back in the day. We're uh, really excited to have you, Melissa. Welcome. Take it away. These are all your folks. Yeah, thanks. I'm so excited to see everybody today. I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. It looked like there was somebody else in Colorado, USA, and excited and appreciative for everybody who's gotten up early in the Australian time zones. Um, I would not be this awake if it was 8 a.m. my time. So um, just to get us started here, you know, we'll be talking about taking Agile across the organization. Well, I'll focus in on marketing. Uh, this, I, I believe, can be, be applied to many different parts of the organization. So whether you're in marketing or not, I think there's a lot of value to be had here. Um, just real quick, let's do a, a poll. It's not a formal Zoom poll. Maybe just, um, oh, somebody's saying they can't hear anything. Is that uh, thumbs up if, if most of you can hear? Yep. All right. So um, I'm interested how many people on the call are marketers versus just maybe interact with marketing or um, are adjacent to marketing. So if you are a marketing, a marketer, uh, go ahead and drop it in the chat, or if you're on camera and want to raise your hand, that'll be a nice visual cue as well. Any of my fellow marketers out there? Interact with marketing. Um, okay, yeah, nice. All right, so we have a couple marketers on here. That'll help me uh, frame my comments as well. So it seems like we have a lot of people who maybe are adjacent to marketing, maybe coach marketing teams. Uh, and we will dive in and get started. All right, so agenda, just, uh, of course, we're gonna be talking about scaling marketing. So how do you do that across the organization? How do you prepare to scale? And then most importantly, how do you stay aligned using SAFE? So um, when you're getting ready to scale, and this is probably true for any transformation, uh, you know, I'd invite anybody on here who's a coach or, or a consultant to, to pipe in. But I would say what not to do, even when you're talking about marketing, is to jump into that deep end of the pool. And I put this slide in here because I was talking to a VP of Agile Transformation. And in my first call with her, she showed me this beautiful Microsoft project plan with her entire transformation laid out for two years. <laughs> and uh, she's like, I know, I know, this probably isn't the way I'm supposed to do this. But uh, it was the only way she knew how, right? Because she was very early in her Agile journey. So just if you're tempted to say, okay, the CMO has given us a mandate to take Agile, mar uh, market, to take marketing Agile, don't do a Gantt chart. <laughs> Uh, just do it iteratively and learn as you go. All right. So now that we know what not to do, let's talk about what to do. And that's to start with one or, or more Agile marketing pilots. And again, a, a lot of times I've seen these mandates happen from uh, either the CEO who wants to take the entire business Agile, or oftentimes there's a CMO, somebody new who has come in, and they, you know, they may or may not even understand what Agile marketing is, but uh, they, they go ahead and they give the mandate and maybe they want to transform the organization at once. Even in that situation, I would highly, highly advise to start with a handful of pilots. And we're going to talk about what that gets you um, in terms of your transformation. So this should feel very, very familiar for those of you who are experienced Agile coaches, right? This is very similar to what you would probably see in uh, a typical transformation. All right, the other thing that's very typical, same in marketing, same in finance, same with audit, make sure that you've identified your why. Now in marketing, it tends to look like these whys. So a lot of times I hear, um, 
marketing executives talk about the need for campaign flexibility and responsiveness. In fact, I was talking to a, a CMO of a, a, it was fast casual franchise uh, here in the US. So they might've had 280 food outlets. And she talked about, <clears throat> about that timeline to get to market. She says it takes us about an hour or a year to develop the food. Now, I don't know if anybody else is in the food service industry, but it surprised me that it took them that long to develop a new menu item for these, these franchisees. She said, but then once we do that, we've got to roll out the marketing campaigns. And because this was a US-based company and the US is huge, uh, she said, different areas need different campaigns. And we just don't have that flexibility that we need to customize those campaigns uh, per store. So that was one of the things that she was looking for. Some of the other things that I've heard people look for are, are my teams doing the right work? I know they're busy, but are they busy doing the right things that will give us the most cust customer value? Um, and then obviously some of these are very, very similar to what you see on the software side, right? Lack of alignment, um, centralized decision making, and then more customer centricity, things like that. All right. Now, this one's kind of interesting. So I started I started this talk just talking about that woman who had the the agile transformation, and she had a Gantt chart. Well, a little known secret, or maybe a not little known secret. Mark, I'm going to call on you over there, Digital Tango. Do you have some spreadsheets in your marketing organization? Uh, yeah, I mean, too many spreadsheets is would be my answer. Yeah, so we we do these spreadsheets, and I don't know about you, Mark, but they're they're very efficient, right? If you're running campaigns over and over, it gives you a nice little template to go on. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. People are familiar with it, and it's easy, so. They, 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 they grab what's what's easy and not necessarily what's best. Yeah. And I faced this as well. I was working with an event company um, right before the 2008 downturn. And this is actually one of my first introductions to agile marketing is we had beautiful spreadsheets like this. We ran about 30 events every year. And these events had very lockstep campaigns. So we would have about a six month marketing cycle and imagine 30 events times six months of campaigns each. I mean, these campaigns were overlapping and a spreadsheet felt like the only way that we could keep track of all of this, this activity, but they also locked us in. So because we had so many spreadsheets going, when the market changed, we couldn't really flex because we might have had, out of those 30 events, we might have had six or seven of those in flight. And so it was very difficult for us to pivot because every, everybody knew their role and you couldn't change six campaigns at once. So what we did is we moved from more of this waterfall campaign. We didn't completely abandon the spreadsheets, but we did institute more of a, a stand-up. We didn't call it a stand-up, and we only checked in a couple of times a week. Um, and we, But in those couple of times a week, we religiously checked our dashboards, and we checked in on those campaigns. And in those meetings, we were able to make decisions, sometimes around something as simple as a subject line, sometimes as big as who we were going to target or shifting the entire nature of the campaign so that we could start to become more responsive to the market. And the big change here was evaluating uh, campaigns in progress versus what we normally did, which was like do a retrospective after that campaign closed. Well, guess what? By then it's way too late, folks. <laughs> All right, so we're trying to move away from those waterfall campaigns. And again, some of this will feel so, so familiar, starting to break down those organizational silos. And software looks a little bit different, but the concept is very, very similar. So in marketing, 
we typically have these functional silos. And within those silos, you oftentimes have a junior level, a mid-level, and a director level or a VP level. So let's just take a copywriting example. You'd have a junior copywriter. You might have a, a copywriting manager, a director of content, and then a VP of content. And inevitably what happens is we create a creative brief, maybe around this digital campaign, and then we hand it off to the junior copywriter who hands it off to their manager, who might even hand it off to the director for this approvals, con um, approvals process. And you're gonna do that through each of these silos. So you can just imagine the weight states that are involved as you're handing things off from silo to silo. And not only weight states, but also the miscommunication that can happen. I don't know how many times I've gotten to the end of a process only to have somebody who initiated the creative brief say, this doesn't look anything like what I intended. So that alignment also gets eroded as you're going from silo to silo. So um, part of this is because what happens in marketing, and I don't know, I mean, let me throw something out there and I'll get somebody from the software side to validate it, which is you get promoted by your level of competence. Do we feel like that's the same on the software side? I see a couple of people nodding. Yes. So I think it's one part competence. And I think it's also one part people skills on the software side. Like, oh, you get along with people. Like, we're going to promote you. So that sometimes happens on marketing. Oftentimes, it's you're really good at your skill. So you get promoted. And that allows you to review everybody else's work, but it also creates bottlenecks. So the mind shifts, the mindset shift we're having people take is the role of the leader. So whether that's a marketing manager, marketing director, marketing VP, is not to come up with all those creative ideas, those great ideas. And in marketing, Think of that creative director, right? Like that's their job is to come up with all the great, great ideas. But the role of the leader is to create an environment in which these great ideas can happen. And that is a pretty big mindset shift for leadership and marketing. And much like um, the software world where you have those middle managers who don't know what the heck they're supposed to do now that Agile's in place, same exact thing has happened. Has anybody experienced this firsthand, gone through um, an agile marketing transformation or seen this? You just pop it in the chat and we can come back to you if you have. All right. Um, all right, so then our, what is our goal? Our goal is to eliminate some of those handoff and delays that we talked about between silos. So I give you a little bit of an example here. This is a landing page that's being created. And the landing page here, so just as we talked about, somebody creates a creative brief, they hand it off to the copywriter. Maybe it takes that person eight hours to write it, but the 96 hours is waiting for it to get to the top of that person's queue. So that's gonna be your wait state. Then they get it written, they hand it off to the graphic designer, Again, graphic designers pretty backed up, so it takes them another three days to get to that. Then, okay, we've got a layout. We've got something for a subject matter expert to review. That, one, that person gets to it pretty fast. It's only a day. It only takes them an hour to review. But inevitably, that person has changes, so it has to go back up to the copywriter for revisions, back through graphic design, before we can get it to the UX team for publishing. So look at the difference there between your wait state or your process time of 19 hours. It only takes us 19 hours of effort and your lead time, which includes all those wait states of 211 hours. We have a lot of, lot of wasted time here in marketing. So what do we do? Cross-functional teams. So this is maybe how you can structure a cross-functional team. I, I struggle with this a little bit because even though it says cross-functional, 
these are functions within marketing. And marketing doesn't work in a silo. So one of the big questions that marketing teams have to ask themselves, especially when they're working at scale, is who else in the organization do we need to be working with? And where my thinking is right now, and this could have all ever changed, but what I've seen is that there will be some parts of of marketing within, and I'm talking large marketing organizations. So one of the organizations I worked with was 3,500 marketers. So that's a lot of marketers. And so some of those people won't necessarily interact with outside parts of the organization. And by that, I mean other business functions. But there will be other parts of marketing that do. And so when you're forming your cross-functional teams, be thinking about that. Do I need somebody from sales on that team? Or maybe sales operations? How helpful would that be? Do I need somebody from our data or analytics teams on our cross-functional teams? Do I need software developers on this team? So this particular example that I've given is pretty localized to a marketing function, but just keep in mind, it doesn't always have to be that way. I think the other point of this uh, slide is take a look at that lead time. So by forming a cross-functional team, we've been able to reduce the lead time from 211 hours down to 47 hours. So there's still folks that are outside the team, in this case, the subject matter expert, but the, the wait states have been largely eliminated, almost, almost seven days. All right, let me take a little pause there. Questions, comments, is this stuff that you've seen before? Yeah, I, guess, I, guess, I, guess, I guess one of the challenges I've seen in trying to achieve cross-functional teams is that some of those functions might not be required on a full-time basis for each team. And, and then you get into you know the notion of part-time resources and, and that implies they could be working on multiple teams and that kind of introduces some inefficiencies. Exactly, yeah. I mean, what do you do in those situations, right? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit as we get into how to scale this and how do you address some of that. Um, let me say it's not perfect. Uh, so one of the organizations I worked with, they, uh, particularly in the data area, they were unable to dedicate full-time people into the teams, and they did have shared resources across those teams. Um, and Jeff piped in, looks like classic job scheduling problem. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of um, pilots going. We want to scale it up. How do we start to do that? So what are the next steps that we do? Again, some of this should feel familiar with, for those of you who have done transformations. We start to look for those additional champions in areas of expansions. So in that organization that had the 3,500 marketers, we, you know, there, there are always going to be people who are excited about the new, new thing. And those are the people you want on your teams as your champions. And then once you've got those champions established, they'll probably know additional people. People will be coming to them. We also did a series of lunch and learns around the progress we were making as Agile teams. And that helped us identify additional champions and additional areas of, of expansion within the organization. So you've got your pilot teams. You might have a few more people leaning in. Then you've kind of got to figure out what's your next tipping point. Like, how are you going to divvy this up? And this is when it can get really challenging, right? Because especially if you've got another safe transformation going, how are those teams organized? Are they organized by business unit where you could take marketers and align them to that business unit? Are they aligned by product lines and you get marketers, product marketers and other people who support that product? into a larger safe for business agility transformation? Is it regional? Um, you know, I've also heard of marketers organizing around what we call the sales funnel. 
So people who are focused on awareness building, education building, um, conversion, post sales. So that's if your organization is very more CX oriented, focused around aligning around that customer experience, they might be organizing in that sort of um, that following that sort of flow. What what have you guys seen? there's anybody who's done a marketing transformation or even just a safe transformation with marketers. Bus by business unit. Anyone else? Let's see your customer segment. Nice. Love it. Yeah. So the banking example I gave earlier where they had the big Gantt chart, um, they, they organized by product line, and I thought it was pretty interesting because in banking, you know, they had everybody from college students who had very, very different banking needs all the way up to those ultra high net worth individuals. So these are your rock stars, your sports stars, the people who are making oodles of money. And so they were able to align their marketers along those different product lines. Uh, and that made sense because they also had other parts of the organization that were aligned around the product. And Samantha, it looks like you agree. You're like, yeah, so I've seen product. <laughs> okay, so you've got your, your people who are leaning in. You've got a sense of how you want to organize this. Identify your guiding coalition. So who are those change agents that are leaning in? And what, um, what resources do you have available? Is there already an Agile Transformation Office or an Agile Center of Excellence within your organization, even if it's in the IT side, that you could lean on? Because chances are they have already gone through a transformation in your context. And so they know what some of those pitfalls to avoid are, and they can help you navigate. Um, you know, For example, if it's safe, they would help you navigate, oh, here's how you might do a value stream mapping. Here's how you start to organize those teams in teams of teams. Now, I've seen, a, I've heard of a couple of models um, around this. One is more of a hub and spoke, where you have a centralized agile transformation office, and then you might have satellite ones in the functions. Now, the other way that I've heard is more of a network of Agile Transformation Offices. And the benefit of the network is, again, it kind of silo us. So if you think of a hub and spoke where you have a central office and then maybe one in marketing, maybe one in audit, maybe one in legal, you still have a little bit of a silo. But if you create these casual networks of people who are committed to business agility and people who are committed to um, guiding that change in the organization, it can help it feel a little bit more fluid. All right, so aligning with your vision, I, I put this up here because sometimes what I've seen happen is let's just say that um, your CMO is wanting you to do the right thing. And by that, I mean, they just want to make sure that you're working on initiatives that align with their priorities. Well, that's great as long as their priorities are aligned with organizational initiatives. So for example, my husband's company, they're really big on the CX experience right now. And they're having everybody go through CX training. It would be a little bit odd if within his agile transformation that then they were they were talking about um, you know, the importance of working on priorities that were aligned to the CMO and those priorities were different than that CX one. So just make sure that whatever you're doing is aligning to not only your, the part of your organization, but maybe those bigger things that are going on. Uh, be prepared to articulate, when you're scaling, be, be prepared to articulate your needs. So I have seen this when this bottom up and people are very, very interested in expanding their agile transformation, but they don't come equipped with the business case. They don't identify, this is what we need in terms of budget. This is what we need in terms of people. These are what we need in terms of tools. 
In fact, what I've seen on the marketing side is oftentimes people will buy a tool to call themselves agile, and then they won't invest in coaching or training. So like I say, shopping is, is kind of the easy part. <laughs> it's easy to buy a tool. It's hard to transform an organization. So as you're looking to scale, be sure to think about these things holistically. Um, yeah, Eric, thanks for your con comment in the chat there. Vision is often expressed as targets or scorecards, OKRs, but these are often competing with each other. So that's that previous slide. Yeah, how do you get your executives to align? So important. All right, then track your results. Um, I see this sometimes with organizations first year in, they get a year in and they're like, oh, we forgot to baseline. So that is another key part of those pilot teams. Um, I see a couple of people nodding here. Yeah, okay. We need to demonstrate measurable improvements from our pilot programs. And by doing that, whether it's employee engagement, whether it's that alignment, whether it's that time to market, make sure you start at the beginning, even if you know it sucks, because then you'll be able to show the progress. And make sure it's centered around the why. All right, in all of this, the reason I've gone through all of this is to help you get executive buy-in. It will help the executives reduce their risk and exposure. So I, I have a little saying that the, the job of the executive is to keep their job, that they really don't want to, they're in this like kind of precarious situation, right? Because on the one hand, They've got to be innovative and forward thinking. On the other hand, they can't be too innovative and forward thinking or they might take too much risk and lose their job. So your job in helping them to commit to an agile transformation at scale, an agile marketing transformation at scale is to help them reduce that risk. And you do that through these pilot organizations, through these pilots to show them what can be done to measure what can be done and to show them that there's organizational support. Just take a moment and let that sink in. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get into the meat of this now, the staying aligned using safe. Before I go there, anybody wants some final thoughts on their experience or anything to add to that? All right, you guys are still drinking your coffee, I can tell. <laughs> there, there, there is a question. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I was just, just about to point out, uh, there's a question from uh, Frederick Champlain. How do you integrate traditional outside agencies, uh, Publix or WPP? I don't know what that is, but maybe you do. Most big agencies, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. look at you. Um, in a cross-functional team approach, my experience is they have historically resisted Agile in part because the transparency afforded by Agile reveals resourcing and process inefficiencies related to their business model. Yeah, I mean, I have faced this one directly, uh, especially as you're talking about these really large ones. So there's two ways that I address this. One is when I shop. So if we are going Agile and we are looking for a new agency, we make it very clear from the outset what our expectations are for that agency. Um, it hasn't always worked, to be quite honest. We have had to let agencies go that don't adopt an agile approach. So then the, the other side of this kind of depends on how big your organization is, which means how big of a negotiating, how big of an account are you? Like, do you have that power to negotiate with these big agencies? And if you can, again, bending them in your direction. Now, it's not always the case that you can bend them in your direction, but I've seen it where you can get them to attend a sprint review. You can get them to attend a sprint planning meeting. You can agree to um, have one person, maybe it's your account manager, drop into those daily meetings. So it takes conversation. It takes a negotiation to try and get to that point. And I 100% hear what you're saying, that some of these agencies are like, that's just not our model. 
and they won't bend in your direction. And quite honestly, I feel like if that's the case, at some point, it might benefit you to change agencies. I don't know. It's, it's sometimes not a very satisfying answer, but I have just seen the havoc it causes when the agency doesn't get on board with the agile transformation. All right, so and happy to chat with you offline on that as well. All right, so let's let's dive into the safe part of this. How do you stay aligned using safe? So the first thing that I do when I'm talking about a scaled agile marketing transformation is I start to look at those parts of the organization that touch marketing. And the example I'd like to walk through here is an online mortgage application. So you want to buy a house and you want to use your phone in order to do it, to fill out your application. It's a new thing for this traditional bank, but they're going to make it happen. So of course, you need a lot of different parts of the organization. You need finance, you need your analytics teams, you need your dev teams, legal, and of course, marketing. So then underneath that, you also need to figure out those parts of marketing that need to touch each other that may or may not be coordinated. So you kind of got two levels here, right? Like what other functions are you touching and what other parts of marketing are you touching? And this is where, uh, Frederick, you talked about the agencies. So do you have agencies that you need to get aligned to this way of working? What about your MarTech teams, all those people who handle your email automation systems and your analytic, your marketing analytics um, things, all of your, your tracking, your events teams, and then other regions in the organization? How do you, how do you start to bring all of this together in order to market your mobile app? All right, so the first thing I want you to think about is identifying those business functions. What are those functions in our mobile app that you'll need? Well, legal probably has something to say about those ads we're running <laughs> and the offers we're extending. Finance, they probably have something to say about the rates we're offering. Let's talk about those new grads in our banking example, and they're ready to buy their first home. And we want to offer them a special financing rate because as marketers, we think that's going to help them get into the market. Well, finance has to approve that. And then the analytics, how are our campaigns running? And of course, we're going to want a landing page. We might want pop-up notifications in our apps. We want some branding in those apps. Marketers are like a needy, we're needy, right? Like we want a bunch of stuff. Okay. So we've identified those functions. Let's then identify the actual people within those functions. Because as I, I forget who it was earlier, I think it might've been uh, Mark you, but um, not everybody has the same level of involvement. So what happens then? That's the third thing we do, is we identify, we have the functions identified, we have the, the people, and then we say, oh, legal, you know, you guys are kind of light, right? We only need you once in a while to sign off on this campaign or sign up, sign off on these terms and conditions for the app. Finance, well, we're going to need to be in much closer communication with you because it's not only about that rate. You're going to have to approve the loan. We're going to have to deliver communications after you approve the loan. We're going to have to say congratulations. We're, there's, there's a lot of coordination with finance. Our analytics teams, now they're really heavy because we're measuring every single step of the way. And same with our dev teams. We want the ability to change things in this app on a fly, not only in the app, but also on a landing page, also in uh, the technology that we're using to deliver our ads. So in our imaginary scenario, this is what we've got. We've got some different levels of involvement. So if it's light, you might just consider a shared service, right? This is this is something we see all the time on the software side, right? And as we know, there's pros and there's cons to these shared services. Uh, so, uh, so the pro is that you get access to these specialized services. In marketing, it could be legal, it could be PR. Is another one where you typically don't have a PR person for every single marketing team. The con is they often get overloaded 
because they are a specialized shared service and it's difficult to get that communication. So just be aware that that's kind of a pitfall of using people as a shared service. Um, there's a great, uh, great quote in the chat. So I'll let you guys read it. It talks about um, the ads were running and the offers were extending. There's a, a movie on Netflix about it. I believe it's a jet with Pepsi. All right, so light involvement, you might consider a shared service. Um, medium involvement, I like went to this really overwhelming graph. <laughs> but let's just say we have the finance teams, right? And that's the these business people right in the, the middle here. And those finance people, like we don't need them all the time, but we need them to kind of be tight with us as we're making decisions. So we want to send some of those business representatives to as many ceremonies as makes sense. So depending on where you're at in the development, maybe you're really deep into negotiating what that interest rates are and what those terms are. Maybe you do want them at your daily standup. Or maybe you just need them at a juncture where you're delivering some um, approval or rejection communication and you want to make sure you've got the words right. So maybe that's at a sprint planning or a sprint review. The goal here, here is that when you've got enough involvement, you're going to want to start bringing those people in so that you have bi-directional communication between the business functions and your, your main, main teams, which in this case is marketing. I hope, though, you can see that this model tends to hold up whatever business function we're talking about, right? So it's audit or it's legal, whatever you've got going, the goal here is, is to create that conduit of communication. All right, now if you got heavy involvement, like I talked about, we've got this heavy reliance on our data people, um, you're probably going to want to embed them, in, if at all possible, into your agile marketing team. So we want them close at hand. We're running campaigns every week. In that example I gave earlier, when I talked about the events and how we were running multiple campaigns at a time, we definitely needed and had um, marketing analysts embedded in the team so that we could get that real-time feedback. Having said that, there is a real shortage out there. So I get that this isn't always possible. But whenever possible, would you have that level of involvement, try and get them on a dedicated Agile team, or I hate to say it because it's an anti-pattern, but sometimes even two teams. I have seen data people shared across a couple of teams. And I feel like I've been talking too much, so I want somebody else to talk. <laughs> uh, so reactions to this, this is kind of the, the model. Uh, we talked earlier about what do you do when you have these different levels of involvement. What do you think? Does this feel doable? Mark says plus one. What other thoughts do we have? Uh, I thought you guys were going to be a talkative bunch. All right. <laughs> I mean, Melissa, if, if, if nobody else wants to chime in, I mean, one pattern I've used is I, I encourage people to participate in PI planning sessions to the extent they feel is reasonable. And that could be, I'm, I'm going to pop in and talk to one team about one specific thing that is happening in the next PI, or I might spend a couple of hours listening to the draft team presentations and then determine, uh, should I show up for the second day? or have them actually be there for the full two-day session to actually interact with multiple teams. And, and you know, depending on, on, on what happens when they are there, that oftentimes will determine what happens next. So what happens next during iteration planning or system demos or other activities that might require a modulated level of uh, participation. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the PI planning is the easy one to reach for. And I think I'm encouraging us to reach for, you know, some of these other ceremonies to keep that alignment throughout the PI, you know, especially if they've got a little bit more involvement, because uh, it's just so easy for other things to uh, to get in the way. All right. 
All right, so we talked about individuals on the teams. You might even embed an entire business team on your art. So this is switching the lens a little bit. If you've got a software team that is focused on delivering this mobile app for, um, for online mortgage applications, you might consider embedding an entire marketing team on that art. I mean, I, I also say that there is such a thing as a marketing art. Now, Dean will disagree with me all day long. There's no such thing as marketing art, he will say. <laughs> but the reason I say that is because when I think about large systems, so an automobile manufacturer, let's talk about Rivian, the new electronic pickup truck. And you are trying to get that thing to market. My guess is there's 50 to 125 marketers that are trying to work together to get that to market and that that's that piece of the the entire solution train better be in alignment with the other parts of the solution train so em you're nodding any thoughts <laughs> oh i could i could buy that um i think you're right i think there's a there's a scale a scale piece there um i was amused you you know dean said um dean says there is no such thing as a marketing art and and look it's interesting if i think about the Australian context, it's probably true um, because our organizations don't scale to the degree that uh, you do in the in the US and therefore you know solution trains and their own little uniqueness without you know getting to a solution train that has a an entire marketing up. But then I can look at you know scale and I can certainly see exactly what you, you're saying. You know, you're building a large system, there's a you know, massive um, marketing effort underpinning that, and would I be tempted to create a marketing art? I, I might be. I might be. Might be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've yet to to talk to somebody who's done it, but I'm I'm still waiting for that marketing art to appear. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's out there somewhere. Yeah, thanks for that. Em. All right, so we talked about kind of three key ways that you can start to scale agile marketing and integrate with the with the rest of the organization without creating that marketing silo, right? That's the key, is we're not trying to move marketing out into its own thing. And so even though I'm standing here as part of the Agile Marketing Alliance, it's not because we believe that Agile marketing needs to become Agile. We believe that marketers have their own language and that if we speak to them in that language, that things will make more sense They'll be able to better integrate with the organization as a whole and help do that, that software translation. So the three things we talked about, identifying the functions that touch the implementation, selecting people in those functions that are needed and determining how involved those people need to be. Um, so that's kind of the nut of it. I've got a section here on le leading change, but I kind of want to open it like this. This is pretty straightforward. Um, I'll, I'll zip through it, but um, if anybody's done safe, this will feel very, very familiar. Um, so, you know, change is hard. People resist change. And then leading change, John Cotter, there's eight steps that he recommends to help get people through change. Um, how familiar are we with this? Are we like, we got this? Yeah, we got, we have people who are got it. All right. So if you don't have it, take a little screenshot, read the book. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot of what we talked about. The reason why I am focused on leadership so much and that I've uh, borrowed some of these graphics from say, Scaled Agile uh, is because what I have seen in marketing is the same as we see in the rest of um, organizations that if you don't have leaders who do more than the hand waves, who do more than just buying the software, who do more than just the training, if they don't embrace the mindset and principles, then they're going to torpedo the, the transformation. And they're going to do executive, executive insertions. They are going to um, not lead by example, uh, which is the next one. Uh, and they're not going to truly lead the change. They'll they'll lead it through budget, but they won't provide that psychological sa safety. They won't have those other hard conversations that we talked about with the executives 
to get aligned on those OKRs. So the whole point of this section was making sure if you're to embark on an agile marketing transformation at scale, that you get more than just the, the budgetary approval, that you truly have executives that are willing to embrace this new way of working. All right, so in a nutshell, these are like your, your little soundbite takeaways, go slow and grow, right? We talked about running the pilots, building that buy-in gradually to reduce risk, then expanding into other teams. We talked about then integrating with those other teams, identifying the functions, identifying the people within those functions, determining their level of involvement. There's one other thing I wanna say here about the level of involvement. It's super tempting. I just talked to somebody last week who wanted to take their marketing organizational agile. Super tempting for the leaders to get in the room and create a brand new org chart and say, hey, this is our, our new agile teams. Highly recommend that you empower your teams. You know, maybe you have a structure in mind to organize by the funnel or by product, and that's fine. But then have people self-select, right? Like we're trying to empower people. And what a powerful way to, to signal to them, like, hey, we we're here to support you. And you tell us where you would like to land. And I don't know how many people I've talked to, their, their minds are just like, what do you mean? Like you're still the leader, like you can override anything, <laughs> but maybe give people a voice. All right, and then, like I said, leadership, 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 make sure they're fully on board, on board, lead with a growth mindset and by example, and make sure they're willing to lead the change. All right, I've got a little free resource for you, the Safe for Marketing white paper, uh, I don't know how many pages it is, maybe 20 pages, goes into a lot more detail on some of these concepts. Uh, and if you're interested in SAFE, I highly recommend starting there. Um, I'm trying to think what else to say about SAFE for Marketing White Paper. Just it's it's there, capture the QR code if you want it. And then come join us. So if you are interested in agile marketing, the Agile Marketing Align is a free global online community where we are bringing the Agile Marketing community together. And we are bringing them together because the community asked us to. So we met last fall, a global group of marketers, and they said, you know, this is a thing, but we don't really have a place to exchange notes. And it's not established enough that we have best practices codified. So we need that place to go where we can exchange ideas, learn from each other. So um, Jim Ewell, who's one of the original signatories of the Agile Marketing Manifesto. Yes, there is an Agile Marketing Manifesto found at agilemarketingmanifesto.org. <laughs> and I have created the Marketing Alliance. Um, we're still pretty early. We're in beta. We're at um, just shy of 500 members. Uh, but we are looking for any and all feedback and invite you to participate and join in the community. And last, I'm always interested in exchanging stories, hearing about your stories, hearing about the struggles that you're having. Feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm just Melissa at AgileMarketingAlliance.com or feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And with that, I, we're close to time, but I think we might have time for a question or two. Oh, you tell me. Yes, please. Is there anyone who wants to? A, a question, um, Melissa. I, I find generally marketing teams have this high uh, need to be super busy um, and then go straight into execution of work. So PR planning and those events um, are really beneficial, but there's still a tendency to go and execute against campaigns rather than setting up campaigns for the outcomes you want and measuring it in the first place. And, you know, next, next bit's action being set up front. How do you overcome sort of a tendency to get super busy really quickly and sort of take a step back? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I, I feel like marketers have this tendency to say yes to too many things. And when I was a PO on our team, 
that was a big challenge was to remove work from people's team, from people's backlogs so they could stay focused. And in the beginning, what I did is I would say, well, these are our top 10 priorities or top three or whatever it was. And they would inevitably have hidden work that was they took on as individuals. Uh, so the first thing we did was visualize all the work. And then the second thing we did is instead of me as the product owner suggesting what the priorities were, I, I turned it to them. And I, I said, you know, if you had to take four things off of this list, like you had to do that, and we're, we're not saying we're not going to do them, but if you had to do that, what would you take off? Inevitably, they would take off the same things that I would have taken off, but they felt much more empowered to do it. And that was just one little way that we started to control some of the whip because people would just take it all in sideways. Melissa, there is a question that's in the chat from Samantha P. Uh, it says, Agile has become a buzzword. Even leadership knows they should be Agile, but if the leadership is not on board in putting work or the work should be done by dev teams, how do you get them on board wanting to be Agile and making changes to become or do more Agile is a very different thing. What, mm -hmm. Any suggestions you might have? Yeah, well, this to me points to like leadership is not on board and putting in the work. It, you know, it's not to say that it can't be successful, but I, I have this motto that says, Agile will only go as far up in the organization as you have leadership support. So if you have a very supportive director, then you can get everybody underneath that director operating in an agile way. But then that does leave you open and susceptible for a VP or another executive to come in and derail your plans. If you have VP level support, then you could probably get everybody under that individual. So I don't know if that really helps, but I think, you know, just keep chipping away at that leadership hierarchy and see how much you can uh, support you can get. And then think about what we talked about in terms of risk reduction, right? How can you show the benefits? How can you reduce risk? How can you make it easy for them to lean in and say yes? Thanks for that. I'm just looking at our time box and I feel like I could spend a, a lot of time just chatting with you, Melissa, and just mining the, the great insights that you have. But we we um, we probably all are looking to transition and unfortunately return to the realities of our days. Um, I wanna thank you so much for spending you know, your time to, to speak to our meetup over here in Australia. Uh, thanks for everyone who's attending from really all over the world, Australia, US, Canada. Uh, we very, very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.